Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Welcome back to America's Heroes Group, our roundtable this time, Mental Health Matters with partner Nami Contra Costa. Today is Saturday, May 6, 2023. May is Mental Health Awareness and Asian Pacific Heritage Month. I'm Sean Claiborne. The co-host, our host is Cliff Kelly. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith. Filling in today is Titus and also our studio engineer today. Our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts on our productions. And we have, of course, with us today, partner Gigi Crowder, executive director of NAMI Contra Costa in California. NAMI is a national alliance on mental illness and advocacy group founded by family members of people with mental illness. And we're going to play a video, audio and video clip of a CBS News uh, uh, Bay Area. We're going to talk about what Gigi had to say and you're going to see her on this with a very, very disturbing and very, very alarming text message that was sent to police officers or amongst police officers. We're going to hear her thoughts on this and to kind of give you some a heads up or a warning or a full disclosure. There's going to be some sensitive information released in this video. So if you are sensitive to that, you may want to use viewer and audio discretion. Those tests haven't been officially released yet, but Mayor Lamar Thorpe is giving us an idea of their disturbing contents. He's now calling for the firing of 24 officers linked to the investigation, and the department is hiring an outside investigator to determine just how widespread the problem has become. Reporter Katie Nielsen spoke with one resident who says those text messages prove what she has felt all along. Katie. Yeah, Ryan, you know, this resident that I spoke with moved to Antioch in 2002. She says when her boys were teenagers, they were racially profiled by police. And that today, with all of the text message that she's seeing, it is confirming some of her greatest fears. Some things in life you want to be wrong. You don't want to be right about them. Gigi Crowder said the racist text messages confirmed what she already thought. At times, Antioch police officers were treating black and brown residents different than her white neighbors. Sometimes you just need the validation. And as hard as it was to read the text messages, I read them because now you have it and proof in black and white that it was taking place. The racist text messages came to light as part of an FBI investigation into the Antioch and Pittsburgh Police Departments, alleging officers were distributing cocaine and steroids, accepting bribes, intentionally using excessive force, and violating people's civil rights. Investigators say some of the officers were part of a text messaging group on their personal phones for years, where they would congratulate each other for hurting people during arrests and using the N-word repeatedly to talk about city residents. I did not want to believe that they were treated badly because of the color of their skin. Last night, Gigi showed up at the city council meeting to talk about an incident that happened in 2007. She says her twin boys, who were 15 at the time, were in Hanson Park near her home, listening to music with three of their white friends. She says officers showed up and arrested only her sons for being in the park after dusk. She says one of her sons is hearing impaired and couldn't understand the officer's commands, so the officer slammed him on the ground, bloodied his face, and shoved his knee into his back. She always questioned whether that treatment was racially motivated. You're breaking dreams. And I didn't even really start realizing that until it was validated by the text messages. Antioch Police Chief Stephen Ford was hired only a year ago and was not with the department at the time of the scandal. He says his main focus is to change the culture of the department and regain public trust. That kind of speech is hurtful to anybody, you know, and it's divisive and um, there's really no place for it um, in policing for sure, uh, but just in society in general. Gigi says while the easiest thing to do would be move away, she is committed to staying and helping the community bridge the racial divide. At the core human values that we carry, that there's more similarities and differences, and that if we could do it anywhere, we should be able to do it here in Antioch. 
I had the chance to talk with the police chief after the city council meeting last night. He told me that some of the officers involved in this scandal have already resigned. Others are on administrative leave, and then some are still working for the department, but they are not in public facing roles any longer. He said that he is committed to making sure that all of the bad apples are out of this department. All right, thanks, Katie. And the Public Defender's Office has called on the DA's office to pause all cases involving the Antioch, Antioch Police Department. We asked former judge and police auditor Ladoris Cordell about the impact to the justice system. It is up to the district attorney, along with the Public Defender's Office, to look at every single one of these cases to determine what really happened. Apparently, according to some of these text messages, these officers had no problem falsifying reports, making up things in order to arrest people. That cannot stand. So it's going to take some tedious work, and perhaps they should bring in someone from the outside. We posted much more about the ongoing fallout, including a video statement from Mayor Thorpe on KPIX.com. And that was the video, folks. Gigi, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay today. We've started the healing process here in Antioch, so my spirits are a little uplifted. So tell us, so what is going on in Antioch? You had, you said you were, you were, your, your kids, your, your boys were harassed. What happened during their time growing up in Antioch? So we live in a, a community um, where I thought it was pretty safe. We were able to purchase a large home in a private gated community, but they were out after dark in the park at 15 with other friends who were European Americans and those uh, Friends came knocking at my door around about 7.45, and they said, Armand and Cameron have both been arrested. I have twin sons that at that time were 15. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I thought they were joking. But then I said, well, what do I do? And they said, you have to go pick them up from the Antioch Police Department. So they had been studying for their AP classes, and they and I had often taken walks in the park. But what the officer said uh, while I was en route, was that they were picked up for a curfew violation. And I was like, curfew violation? You said, yes, they were not supposed to be in the park after uh, dusk. And I was like, you go to jail for something like that? But when I picked my younger son up, who does have a hearing impairment, he actually had a lot of bruising on the right side of his face. So I was, you know, mama bear, I was, you know, ready to harm whoever had harmed my son. Mm. But these text messages coming out after the investigation, as I said, validated that they were probably racially profiled that night because the other y young people, none of them, you know, got the type of treatment that they got with being thrown to the ground um, for just being simply in a park after the sun started going down. So basically, they were just in the park, the sun went down, and then all of a sudden, 5 0 rolls up and it throws them to the ground and treats them like they are, you know, killing somebody or doing something crazy, disrupting the whole scene, and all they're doing is just hanging out in the park. Yeah, I, I was told by the older of the two, by 11 minutes, that uh, Cameron said, What did you say? Because as I said, he had a hearing impairment. And then the cop said, You're a tough guy, huh? And next thing you know, his brother was on the ground. And of course, the way I raised my son, this twin, he was not going to, you know, just stand there. So he probably made some type of a movement, and then they grabbed him and put him in the back of the car as well. Now, your boys, did they grow up in church? They were praise dancers, or, or more specifically, mind dancers, and they were members of the church at that time dancing. And so I did go the next day with my pastor to the um speak with the police chief, what I learned that I did know that day was that the Eternal Affairs officer that took the report later became the police chief, and he was actually the police chief through this era with all of the text messages. He only left about a year ago. But he said to me that day, don't let what happened impact your sons. But sadly, even though they was raised in the church, it did impact their mental health because they were traumatized because they're were college-bound students with a lot of support from the community, praise dancers. And after that day, 
having been arrested. I'm pretty sure there was shame associated with the trauma and all of that. That was not anything I ever would have expected with my son. So I think a, a bit of their spirits both got broken that day. I couldn't imagine a praise dancer in a church doing something disruptive in a park when the sun is going down. Well, it's they, hanging out in the park. Yeah, they were actually um, listening. It was the first day a Kanye West song had been released, and they were with their friends listening to the album. And uh, I let them go because, as I said earlier, often we would wait in Antioch. It could get upwards of 95, 100 degrees during the day, so we had a practice of waiting until it cooled off and then taking a walk through the park and doing the laps there. So it, was not, it wasn't the first time they'd been in the park after dusk. Was it known that there was a curfew? You know what? I didn't pay much attention to the sign because I'd been in that part with police going by, not, not, you know, not bothering us many times before. So there's a sign that posted that says um, you can't be in the park after dusk. Mm. And it was just on the fringe of it that, that, that uh, summer I've been in the park like a lot of times or been places, the beach or the park or whatever, and the sun goes down and usually the police has come up and they just say, oh, hey, the park's closing or somebody says the park's closing or the beach is closing and we just walk off or they, you know, they kind of do their sweep. I mean, here in Chicago, we got the, we got the rocks. We call it the rocks where by the Lake Michigan, there's, there's a place where people still go there after dark, but uh, since it's a nice spot for couples to kind of go and watch the moon, you know, come up or the sunrise, whatever. But, you know, it's not something that's not something that warrants bruising on your face to get just because you're just, you know, hanging out in the park. And I and I don't I couldn't see your kids not being disruptive or not being compliant if somebody said you had to leave the park anyway. Right. So I think when my son mentioned that he didn't understand what the cop was saying because he has a hearing. It's only on one side. But if the cop was if he was already, of course, hit because you get confronted by a cop, right? Mm -hmm. And we all, I think, as African-Americans, have some already inherent fears of cops based on the history of uh, what has happened to African-Americans, and I'll say in particular, black young men with cops. So he probably was pretty anxious. He might have been also baffled at the idea that you're going to, you know, bother us because of a park curfew when there's so much more going on you could be focusing your attention on but what i do realize is uh, my sons were luckier than others because now that these text messages have come out there was definitely intentional harm brought to some of my fellow african-american uh, neighbors and tell us, once again, a little more about these text messages. I know the, the, uh, the video couldn't or didn't show or didn't reveal what was actually in the messages. Um, are you willing to say or do you know what was in the messages that we should know about, or do yes. you want to bring that up? Yes, I just left. As I said, I, I'm starting the healing process at NAMI Contra Costa. We recognized right away that we needed to mobilize and start getting some community listening sessions to start the healing process. So. We invited the public defender, um, Alan McDonald, um, here in Contra Costa County, and she actually shared a lot more than I was aware of about some of the actions, things like changing um, through text messages, changing police reports, standing up for each other, lying on the stand, intentionally targeting some African-Americans for harsh treatment. Um, I mean, it all started with a probe around them selling drugs and, and, and steroids. And then it feels like uh, when I did that interview, we were saying, they were saying a half a dozen. Then it was a two dozen. Now we're talking about 45% of the Antioch Police Department were a part of either sending out text messages or being in the, in the group text, meaning if you you know, our law enforcement and you are aware of a crime, it's your duty to report it, even if it's amongst your fellow officers. Mm -hmm. And that did not happen. So we're probably looking at uh, uh, two of our congressmen have called for, you know, federal Department of Justice uh, involvement in these situations because it sounds like uh, I spare myself from some of the text messages because, you know, I got to. I'm a woman of God, of great faith. I, I got to spare myself from too much trauma, 
but it was very triggering to hear of what happened and the possible role it played in the shift that my sons had around what their future might be like. So these text messages, they basically were this people confessing that they were selling drugs, selling steroids, narcotics and steroids, and then also using a racially charged language, racial epitaphs or slurs, racial slurs. That's the other thing I could, that comes to mind, I think, of racial right. sensitive information. Yeah. Yep. They talked, um, uh, several of the officers were a part of the, as a matter of fact, the, the, the main um, challenge we had is that the, uh, I guess the president of the police union was amongst the group of individuals. Internal affairs was a part of it. And when I share with you, I took my complaint to an internal affairs, not knowing they rotate it. So it's like there really wouldn't be any police accountability in the city of Antioch. I start telling young people as we do these groups, at this point, sadly, we have to treat cops guilty into proven innocent. Mm -hmm. Now, this is just dis disturbing on many, many different levels. Uh, tell me a little bit about Antioch as a community. How was it? What's the demographics of Antioch? And then also, it, what's, what's the demographics uh, of the police force? Is it, does it reflect the community? No. So Antioch is actually 60% BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color. So we have more from those communities than we do, um, you know, in totality than white Americans. But it was a sundown town. So we now hear stories of 30 years ago, if you were African-American, you did not feel safe being here after dark. And you only usually think of that in the South. Um, Antioch is a city in which individuals like me, who are African Americans, found opportunity to come and purchase, you know, 3,500 square foot homes for a lot cheaper than the Bay Area, Oakland, San Francisco, where it was so much more expensive. So we were professionals. Many of us commuted back into Oakland and San Francisco, you know, for our jobs. But, uh, uh, the economic for African Americans is relatively high in Antioch because two parent households with, you know, two professionals in the home, and so we got to get our swimming pools and have have our barbecues in the backyard or the side yard, not in the front of the house where you know if you live in an apartment or something like that you would have to do. So we thought we were getting a piece of the American dream, but Antioch became one of those make Antioch great again uh, cities, I believe. What does that mean? What do you mean by make Antioch great again? Well, you know, Mega, Mega is the campaign mm -hmm. that was ran against people who had some obvious disregard for uh, communities of color. And so we've had a couple of politicians in Antioch say make Antioch great again, meaning let's not, let's take it back to where it was when it was a sundowner. Um, uh, city and uh, we are. Oh, was this was know, this in response because a lot of blacks are moving into the community because now it's sixty percent black. Of, the, so when we had the economic downturn, many of the homes that had once been purchased by African American professionals uh, started renting out. A lot of people lost their homes, so people uh, started using Section Eight as an option. So we did have an increase in Section Eight tenants, which brought a bought more low income, not all African American, but Af uh, Antioch also is the city within our county that transports the greatest number of African American youth to our juvenile hall. We only make up 10% of the overall county, but we're very overrepresented in a juvenile justice system. And now we know that the bulk of those cases were brought about by cops from Antioch and the neighboring city, Pittsburgh. So both Antioch and Pittsburgh are under federal FBI. Um, there are several officers in Pittsburgh as well. I think they're up to 10 who were a part of this um, investigation. And then Antioch with 44 officers. Wow. So what is being done now? So there's, there's the FBI investigation. Are there any, any civil cases or any uh, legal cases that are going on between the, the, the people who live in the residence who have been exposed to this type of harassment? Yeah, so there's a pretty well-known civil rights attorney, Don Burris, who typically handles a lot of police uh, brutality and uh, often um, police violence cases. He came and has filed a federal lawsuit 
um, I have chosen and spoken to my sons about it, and we want to focus on the healing part, so having community conversation. And actually, we decided that this was happening. No one really knew about it. Of course, they felt that, you know, having been victim, and that this is God's way of uh, revealing it because we're working toward having, you know, healing hubs. All of my focus this year was intended to be on the fact that it's both Mental Health Awareness Month, but also Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So I had a lot of a lot of trainings and focus working with my my Asian American um, Pacific Islander staff. And then because of this, they've been very supportive of allowing me to shift some of my attention onto the healing that needs to happen here through dialogue. So we're going to have, we had an event today where we kicked it off and then next week we'll be having conversations with the police chief who was only on the job for a year, but I don't know how you can, you know, start mending and healing without him hearing from the youth about how they're feeling about all of this because we definitely want to break the um, the school to prison pipeline and we think we we see more opportunities now for that to happen with the attention being I've gotten some funding I've been asking for for a long time to have an African-American holistic wellness hub and so that probably would not have happened um, from our board of supervisors had this not happened so I have to look at the opportunities for us now to um, justify why there needs to be specific services for African Americans and I figure I will be able to justify the need for that for also other BIPOC communities like the Asian American Pacific Islander community as well. So in the last couple of minutes, tell us if for someone who has never really experienced, maybe somebody who lives in another state where they don't, they don't, they're not aware that they don't, it's totally a foreign experience to be uh, harassed by police. Tell me how you feel as a parent from your personal perspective. What would you say to someone about how you feel and what your fears are and what you're angry about regarding what's going on? This, can you express that in about two minutes to someone who's never, who's, who's completely unaware of what's happening in the world today with this particular it's topic? It's undescribable. I, I never thought I'd ever experience the look of pain on my children's face when I went and picked them up from the police department because, you know, of course, their goal was to never be arrested. Uh, and why would they be and never have a docket, as they call it? And so even though the charges were dropped, as I said, as a, as a parent, we had to work through that traumatic experience together. So if you've been arrested in a park before, my going to that park, just it. my mental health was definitely compromised. I was traumatized uh, thinking about it, you know, that, that my sons were harmed and I wasn't there. And actually when the cops brought them down and I saw my son's face, I felt myself going forward to harm the cop who harmed my son, but I felt a pressure pushing me back, and I know it was just the hand of God that kept me from also, you know, mm -hmm. making a poor decision that could have, you know, ended up with me also having, you know, some harm, physical harm done to me. So mm -hmm. it's indescribable. Our, our, our jobs are to protect our children, and when we can't do it, there's a breaking of trust sometimes with the children mm -hmm. as well. Gigi Crowder, appreciate your time. You're executive director of NAMI Contra Costa. That's the National Alliance of Mental Illness, an advocacy group funded by family members of people with mental illness. I appreciate your story and also I wish you success. I want to follow up on this and kind of tell us what's going on as the months go by and how the progress is being done. And I would like to see this also in national news outlets because this is something it that's is, very. It, has been. it actually has been on CNN and, and others. Yeah. If okay. you Googled it, you would see it, it went national. Yeah. Perfect. So we want to have people, if you're listening to this uh, broadcast now, seeing it on America's a Heroes Group, check out the, the follow this story. You know, put your two cents in, communicate with this on social media, get this blowing up. People need to be aware of what's happening and also the, the, so, the social cost of police harassment. Appreciate you, Gigi. Thank you. This is America's Heroes Group. Make sure you see all of our shows on America's HG or our YouTube page or on Facebook. We have a ton of archive shows that talk about all these different types of topics and things you can find out about how to get connected to your benefits, how to, uh, to navigate the world of being a veteran, and also civilians. If you don't know much about the military, there's a lot of useful information about how to handle or how to work with someone 
who is going through something in the, in the, in the veteran community. This is America's Heroes Group. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your listens. Appreciate your ears. We'll be right back again next Saturday, 4 to 6 p.m. Also, once again, see us on americashg.org. If you have any questions, inf- email us at info at americashg.org. And you can always call us. And i got to get that card out again. I always get yelled at because I always forget to bring the card out. And the card says that you need to call 312 312- 803-2618. That's 312-803-2618 if you're still doing that kind of thing nowadays. We'll see you next week.